All right, 1 Kings chapter 20. So, um, of course, last week we just had, uh, we, we went over Elijah and kind of how he got depressed and everything. And at the end of chapter 19 last week, one of the things that he was told to do was to go and anoint Hazael to be king of Syria. And I had mentioned last week how he didn't do that. Elijah didn't do that. Elisha ends up telling um, Hazael that he'll be king of Syria. But Elijah did not do that. And where we're starting now here, I, I don't think it's any coincidence, of course. I mean, everything in the Bible is there for a reason. It's given in the order that it is. In chapter 20 now, it's like we're going back up, all the way up to, you know, about chapter 17. We were going through all the, the kings of Israel. You know, we started off the book of 1 Kings. We talk about Solomon and Rehoboam and, all, you know, in the temple. And that was kind of ate up a lot of the first few chapters, going into detail about that. And then we went into some other kings of, um, of Israel mostly, but Judah also. And we got to the point where we were talking about kings. And then we kind of started with Elijah. And, uh, and we got a few chapters of just dealing with Elijah's life and the things that he was doing, which coincides with where we're at chronologically in, in the book of 1 Kings. And now we're kind of picking back up into the, the rest of the king's story. So we only got three chapters left in 1 first, first Kings. We got chapter 20, 21, 22. And then we're going to be done with this, with this whole book. But we're noticed that we're, as soon, what we're picking up with here in chapter 20, verse number 1, says, And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. So this is the current king of Syria. It's Ben-Hadad. And this is the king that God was, was planning on overthrowing. And we know from Scripture, the Bible says that God will lift up and God will bring down who he chooses. So it could be rulers in this world. They could be wicked rulers. They could be righteous rulers. God can lift them up. God lifted up Pharaoh just for his glory to be made known. Ben-Hadad is in a position here where God's getting ready to, to take him down, which is why he was telling Elijah, hey, prepare Hazael because Hazael's going to be taken over from Ben-Hadad. Now, we know that Hazael was no righteous guy either, but it was Ben-Hadad's time to go down. And that's why God was telling him to, to do what he did. And we're going to see here a little bit of the character of Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad was a big bully, is what he was. And we're going to see that here in a minute. Um, look at verse number one. The Bible says, And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city and said unto him, Thus saith Ben-Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine. Thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. So what happens is Ben-Hadad gets his host together, his big army, and he travels to Syria, or I mean, it's not to Syria, to Samaria, excuse me, He's the king of Syria. He travels to Samaria and he's got these other, you know, he's been conquering and he has all these other kings now with him, 32 of them, and their horses and their chariots and their armies and they're all surrounding Samaria. So they're outside going, they got their big force, right? And the, and the people are stuck inside the city and he's saying, well, guess what? All your silver and your gold belongs to me. I'm taking over. I want what you got. I'm just taking it over because I'm, you know, he's just on a conquest to, to take over their stuff. I mean, that's, that's one of the main reasons for war is that people want something that someone else has. And that's what bullies do. I mean, you just go back to your, to your uh, typical, stereotypical bully, right? What does a stereotypical bully do at school? He steals kids' lunch money, right? He, he, he tries to find the, the weak person someone who's not going to put up a fight, someone who's not going to challenge them and just threaten them and try to extort whatever he wants from them. You know, give me your lunch money, kid, or I'll beat you up. Right? And this is the exact same attitude we see Ben-Hadad going at Ahab with. And Ahab's weak. Ahab's a weakling. Now, I mean, his first answer, he doesn't even say like, he, he doesn't say anything back to him other than just, oh, my Lord, O oh King, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. So right away, he's just falling on his knees and just saying, like, just take it all. I belong to you. 
Because, I mean, he said, your silver, your gold, it's mine. Your wives and your, ch your, wives and your children. I mean, just coming, you say saying, like, not only, it's one thing to part with, like, your financial goods, right? To say, okay, well, I'll give you all my money. Someone's coming to rob you, fine. Take my, take my stupid money, right? But he's like, your wives and your children. I don't know about you. I mean, everyone in here, if you're married, you only have one wife, but at least as far as I know. <laughs> Otherwise, you're keeping a really, really big secret. But what, what husband in this room is going to say, if someone approached you and said, your wife and your children now belong to me, are you just going to say, okay, go ahead and take them? Not even close. But look, this is what he said. And again, it's important not to just read over things in the Bible. Let's look at it and be like, this is, the, I mean, this is what he said. He's saying, look, even with a whole army, I don't care if, if there's a whole gang or mob of people surrounding my house and they said, hey, give me all your money and your wife and your children because they belong to us now. You think I'm not going down without a fight? <laughs> you, think, you think anything is going to make me give up what's most dear to me in my life, my wife and my children? Absolutely not. No way. If anyone wants to try that, you're going to bet you're going to have a fight coming. But see, the bully Ben Hadad, I don't know if he knew this or not, but he goes and picks on Ahab, and Ahab just falls on his knees weeks. And if I, okay, yeah, just take whatever you want. You can have it. You can take my, my money, you can take my wives, and you can take my children. Go ahead. Look at what, um, what the answer is then, because he, he responds and just saying, okay, fine, it's all yours. But see, that's not what Ben Haydad wanted, really, anyways. That's what he's saying. He comes to him, he's just trying to pick a fight. And he's thinking, like, <laughs> he's not going to fight me. <laughs> After asking it, telling him to give me his wives and his children, look at verse number five. It says, And the messengers came again and said, Thus speaketh Ben-Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying, Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children, yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. So now he's poking them even more, saying, Okay, you know what? I know this is what I said to you. But now I'm changing the story. I'm going to come in. I'm going to send some of my servants. They're going to go. They're going to walk right into your house and into your servants' houses. And they're just going to take anything that they want. Anything they see on the wall, anything you got in there, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever they see, if they want it, they're just going to take it. Now Ahab finally starts to realize what's going on here. Look at verse number seven. It says, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. For he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. Wherefore he said unto the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, All that thou didst send for to thy servant at the first I will do, but this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. And one of the things you can learn about this, and, and it's indicative of a bully, is that once you give in to them, they're never going to be satisfied. If you back down and just give in and just say, oh, okay, you're just going to come and take all my stuff. Here, you can have this. Here, you can have my children. You know what they're going to do? They're going to ask for more. It's never going to be enough. And it really is just that power. They just want to have power over you and control you. And that's why it's important, especially kids, you know, learn this. If, if people start to bully you and want to bully you in your life and just, and just control you and, and take everything that belongs to you, you know, you ought to stand up to those people. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil's another bully. I mean, he, he likes to make people... And here's the thing that's common about bullies, too. They want to make you think and give off this impression that they're real strong, they're real tough, they're real powerful, Right? And usually inside, they're just big cowards. Anyways, that's what it boils down to. They, they put off a great illusion. They may be big or, you know, whatever. They look like, oh, man, I don't know what to do about this person. They, they just look so big. I better just do whatever they say. But see, when you give in to a bully, it's out of fear. And the Bible tells us not to fear. fear when you have fear, that any fear that's not of God, 
that's not you know, fearing the Lord is a sin. The Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and it goes through that whole list. It says, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We ought not to be fearful, not fearful of what man can do. And look, this applies in all areas of your life. Don't live in fear. Right. Nothing, no decisions that you make should be based on fear. Right. You can make a wise decision. You may make a decision one day to, you know, if someone's going to rob you of some money, to give them your money. And I'm not going to say that's a stupid decision, right? If you're, if you're faced with gunpoint, that may be a decision. But you know what? You still, even in a situation like that, you don't want to make decisions based off of fear. All too often what happens is, and, th and this is really sad, but if you know anything about the way, that, that the way criminals work and crimes, especially when it comes to like kidnappings, and especially with women and with children, with rapes and things like that, you're always told the wise thing to do is to not go along with what whoever the abductor is trying to say to you and, get, and just get you to stay quiet and go with them. 90-some percent of the time when you go away with that person, you're not coming back. The wise thing to do, even though you're scared, even though like someone's got a knife to your throat or a gun to your head or something like that, the best thing for you to do is to make a bunch of noise and to fight and to resist and to not let them have their way. Because if, you, if they get you gone, you're going to be gone and you're not coming back. They're going to get you to a place where they're not going to get caught. But fear is going to tell you not to do any of those things just to go along because they're scaring you into, into believing what they say and to doing what, they're gonna, what they want you to do and them getting that power over you. Ahab, I don't know why he has to go and consult people when they come back. It's like, he should have consulted them right off the bat before just saying, okay, you know, because obviously they seem to have somewhat of a backbone. Instead of saying, fine, you can have my wife and children. But there's certain evil and th you know, people that, that, that need to be resisted. The devil is one of them. The Bible says you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Think about how scary Satan can be. Think about all the things that Satan did to Job. Think about all the things that Satan can do to people in this world. It's a very scary character. I mean, ho even Hollywood will tell you, the horror movies, right? How many horror movies have Satan in it? I mean, it's a scary thing. But we ought not to be afraid of Satan, of anybody. Now, is Satan powerful? Sure, there's a lot of power that Satan has. The angels and Satan, and us as humans, they have more power than we do just, just in general, the way that, that we are created. But we still don't have to fear or worry about that because we have more power through God, ultimately. We have faith in the Lord and God will look at it. If we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and watching our steps, then God will be there to protect us. And if he doesn't, it's according to his will. So we have no, re no logical reason to fear, no real reason to fear. It's because people are deceiving us and putting up a big front when we do fear. Ahab, though, Ahab wasn't walking with God. Ahab wasn't doing that which is right. He was a wicked king. He was living wickedly. So... He had no confidence. Of course he's going to be fearful. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know what the Holy Spirit gives you? Boldness. It's the opposite of fear. When you're doing what's right by God, God will give you boldness. You, you'll know that you do not have to back down. Look at all the apostles. Look at the prophets when they were confronted. Look at Elijah. Right? Confronted by everybody. Confronted by the king didn't back down, but still did what was right and proclaimed the, the, the word of the Lord and did what needed to be done. Why? They were filled with the Holy Ghost. God, God was blessing them. The strength of Samson is a good picture of that, is a good image of that, of someone that, that the Holy Ghost came upon Samson and gave him strength, right? You'll have strength when, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God. So that's how you deal with bullies because they're not going to stop. When they come at you, they're going to keep coming at you. 
unless you stand up to them, unless you resist them, the devil is going to keep attacking you. If you don't, if you feel like the devil's attacking you and, and trying to get you into all this sin and you're being tempted all over the place, you got to resist that and, and, and know this, that if you resist long enough, he's going to flee from you. You will get the victory. It's not going to be something that lasts forever. It will come to an end. And the bully's the same way. I said, usually the bully's a bunch of cowards. And they're used to, the reason why they get to the point where they're at is because a lot of people won't stand up to them. They get confidence built because they could scare people and make people afraid into just giving them whatever they want. But when push comes to shove, figuratively and literally sometimes, they just turn out to be big cowards. We'd, I dealt with that just when we moved into our new house. Didn't realize it, but ended up moving in next to a bully. Someone who didn't, didn't like, just whatever, didn't like our dogs, didn't like some things about our house, and then came over to my house and tried threatening me with nothing else but my kids. I mean, what did Ben Haydad do? He went up and said, give me your wives and your children. What did my neighbor do? He came over and saying, you know what? I'm taking pictures and I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to call CPS. And look, I wasn't doing anything wrong at all. At all. It was some, it, he was upset about my dogs defecating in my own yard. Right? And it was getting cleaned up like every other day, like normal. I mean, no big deal. But I have a few dogs, so they make a mess. Right? I mean, they go, they go outside. They go a few times a day. And it is what it is. But he didn't like that. And he couldn't keep his own nose and his own business and not worry about what's going on in my, in my house. So he comes over, but guess what? I'm not going to be bullied. Now, I'll be reasonable. I don't want to be a bad neighbor. If someone's got a problem with me, I'll do my best to try to work with you and, and not have a conflict because I'm not contentious. I don't want to fight with people. But you're going to come over and start threatening my children, threatening to have my children removed from me? Guess what? I'm not going to back down, buddy. And I didn't. And you know what happened? He ended up moving. He did. A couple months later, he's gone. Amen. Now, you know who gets a credit for that? The old me, God gets a credit for that. I praise God for that because I really, I was starting to be concerned. I wasn't afraid, but I was getting concerned because when someone threatens you with your kid, that's a serious threat. Whether that, you know, I don't know what he's willing to do. And like, I mean, my kids and my wife are the most important things to me in this life. So I, and I got a serious problem. I got I to learn. I got to figure out how to deal with this. I don't want to walk in the flesh and deal with it that way. But I'm also not going to back down. And the Bible doesn't say that you have to be a big coward. You could still stand up and resist and, and, and do what's right and, and still do it a, a, you know, a Christian way. And that's what needs to be done. And, and you need to stand up for people who are, gonna, who are just going to try to walk all over you and, and dictate to you and tell you what you're going to do with your life. You got to watch out for them. There's bullies out there. There'll be bullies out there out soul winning. I've encountered them too. And they'll try to tell you that you can't go out soul winning and you better not go over to that door. And you know what? You got to just keep doing it. I've seen it time and time again. Someone, someone gets angry with you because they hate God. They don't want to hear what we have to say. So we say, okay, fine. We'll see you later. You know, like... Whatever. Because what, we're not going to try to cram anything down your throat. You want to listen? Fine. We'll go somewhere else. But then every once in a while, you get the person that says, oh, don't you go talk to them. And if you're not filled with the Spirit, if you're not going to be bold, you might be, if you start getting afraid, you might just, just let them dictate what you're going to do when you're trying to do God's work. And don't let them do that. Because that's what, that's what they're expecting you. That's what the bully does. They expect you, they, they expect you to get afraid and just tuck tail and run. That might be what the Jehovah's false witnesses do or the Mormons, but that's not what a spirit-filled preacher of God's word is going to do. Someone tells you, someone tells me to stop doing that. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> you better bet I'm walking right up to that door. I'm going to preach that person that gospel because that's nothing other than, than Satan telling you not to go out and preach the gospel. And the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Let's keep reading here. Let's see what happens because uh, 
he finally realizes like it doesn't matter what I tell this guy he's gonna keep on just getting more and more and more unless I stand up unless I do something about this verse number uh, Oh, what's also interesting, I mean, he's still so weak, though, in verse number nine, because he says, he says, all right, well, tell him, look, everything that you said the first time, I'll still do that, right? Like, you could still have my wives and my children and all my gold and silver, but this thing, you know, I'm drawing, I'm drawing my line in the stand right here. It's like, come on, come on, Ahab. Grow a spine. Verse number 10 says, And Ben-Hadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me and more also. If the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. That was actually a good response. Because Ben-Hadad is so lifted up with pride. He's so confident. He's so full of himself. And he's just saying, you know what? because you refused everything to me, which is what he wanted anyway, is a fight. He's saying, you know, God do so unto me and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for a handful all, for all the people that follow me. Saying that I'm going to bring such a large army that you're, you know, we're going to obliterate you. And um, King of Israel finally is saying, you know what, buddy? Don't, you know, don't start boasting about you getting this victory over us before you've even... Before you've even uh, armored up for war. That's what it means. The him that girdeth on his harness boasts himself as he that putteth it off. Right? You can't boast about something you've done until after you've done it. He's saying be careful not to get, get too lifted up there boasting about yourself. Look at verse number 12. And it came to pass when Ben-Hadad heard this message as he was drinking he and the kings in the pavilions that he said unto his servants set yourselves in array and they set themselves in array against the city. And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. And Ahab said, By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? And he answered, Thou. It's no mistake, we're going to see this in another place uh, in a couple more verses as well. Ben-Hadad is drinking. And one of the things that happens when people are drinking, one, you lose your judgment, but two, oftentimes people will get their beer muscles, right? They start to feel like they're extra tough, more tough than they really are. That's why, and, you know, that's why even if you don't drink, you shouldn't be hanging around with bars where people are getting drunk because you got tough guys like this that get a little bit of alcohol in them and they're just looking for a fight. They just want to fight anyone. I've known people, I've seen it happen myself, where people will be standing around and looking just to instigate fights in bars. Because that's what they do. Because you get drunk and people get stupid and they just want to fight. They just want to prove something to themselves. Because inside they're a coward. And the, the way that they have to try to prove themselves to be tough is to try to beat up somebody that didn't do anything to them. And they want to make themselves feel good because inside they know they're a real small man. And they can't handle that. And it eats them up, so they want to try to prove how tough they are by beating up random people. Because they're nothing. But Ben Hadad's over there drinking. And he's like, he hears the response. He's like, oh, he's not going to say that to me. You know, set the battle in array. But what he doesn't know is that God actually approaches Ahab. Well, the man of God, the prophet of God, brings the message of the Lord to Ahab, and he's telling him, you know what? You're going to get this victory. See, God already knew who he wanted to win in this battle. God knew he wanted to bring Ben-Hadad down low. Ahab is still a wicked man, and he's still a wicked king. So it's not like any virtue of Ahab is giving him God's grace and God's mercy in this battle. It's because God's choosing to bring Ben-Hadad down. But you also notice, though, Ahab's getting another chance here. Ahab had that first chance with Elijah. Remember when, because when, he was present when Elijah was offering up his offering and all the sons of Belial were offering up their offerings and God answered by fire and everyone saw, hey, the Lord is God. 
Apparently, that still wasn't enough for Ahab, though. But what he tells them here, the, the prophet that talks to Ahab, he says in verse 13, he says, Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So God's telling them again. He's saying, you know, you're going to win this battle. This is why he's even, because God didn't have to tell him anything. He could have just let, let him get the victory. But he wants to make sure Ahab knows it's not because of you that you're getting this victory. It's so that you know that I am the Lord and that I can do anything. And that you can have the biggest armies surround you and come against you. But if God is going to fight for you, no one's going to stand. Nobody can stand before you. Giving him the evidence, showing him you can trust me, you know, get, making his, his name be known. And he's, ans he's asking these questions like, well, who's, who's going to fight? The young men are going to fight. He said, who's going to lead the battle? You are. You're the king, dummy. Right? Like, you're going to do it. Come on, Ahab. But it's really interesting how he, how he gets this, this extra chance. And we're going to see later he ends up humbling himself. But um, <clears throat> look at verse number 15 here. Then he numbered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were 232. And after them, he numbered all the people, even all the children of Israel being 7,000. That's not very many people at all. First of all, he was saying, who's going to do it? He's saying the, 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 the princes of the provinces, 232 people. That's who's going to fight. And then he's going to lead that battle. And even all of the children of Israel that were there to fight, 7,000 people. That's nothing compared to Ben-Hadad with his 32 kings and their host. I don't think he was exaggerating when he was saying that, you know, the host is going to come, that if, if all the dust of Samaria would suffice for the host that he's going to bring. You know, obviously it's a little exaggeration, but I mean, he's, he's explaining. I mean, there's going to be millions probably coming and, you know, against 7,000. Verse number 16, and they went out at noon. Look at this. But Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions. He and the kings, the 30 and two kings that helped him. He has one that shows you he has no respect for them. He, he just thinks, he's so lifted up with pride that this is no big deal and I'm just going to party and just get drunk and who cares. Not taking it seriously at all. Not even th thinking that there's going to be a battle. Just, which is why he came there in the first place and just was saying whatever he could say to pick the fight with someone way weaker than him just to, just to get more stuff because he's a big bully. And here he is getting drunk. And uh, him and his 32, his 32 buddies that, that can't think for themselves either. They're like his yes men. Verse number 17, and the young men of the princes of the provinces went out first. And Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, there are men come out of Samaria. And he said, whether they be come out for peace, take them alive, or whether they be come out for war, take them alive. So he's just thinking, like, this is no big deal. Like, I don't care if they came out to fight. I don't care if they didn't come out to fight. He says, you just go over there and you take them alive. That's what I want you to do. Again, no respect at all whatsoever that anything could possibly happen to him he is sitting secure he thinks he's got it all figured out and everything's just fine verse number 19 so these young men of the princes of the province came out of the city and the army which followed them and they slew everyone as man and the syrians fled and israel pursued them and ben hadad the king of syria escaped on a horse with the horsemen and the king of israel went out and smote the horses and chariots and slew the syrians with a great slaughter God brings the victory. There is no good reason why this battle would have gone the way it did except that God was fighting for them. It's the only reason. They were completely outnumbered. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us the exact numbers, but he says it is a great slaughter that basically Ben-Hadad barely even escapes. He has to get on a horse and just flee out of there because they're just, they, they killed every man their sword that came against them and they got them to retreat. They were pushing so hard against the enemy that the Syrians had to run away. Verse number 22. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. So now he's saying, get ready. He gets an extra warning saying, strengthen yourself. Be ready for another fight because at the end of the year, he's going to come back. 
This isn't over yet. Yes, you got this victory, but it's not done. He's coming back. So make sure you're ready. Get strong. Verse number 23, And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are gods of the hills. Therefore they were stronger than we, but let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. I mean, this just shows you the silliness of, of people who believe in these false gods. Or, oh, the gods of the hills and the gods of the plain and all these various gods. And See, that's why that's, well, we have to come up with some reason because they had to recognize there is no reason for them to have lost. They knew that there was no reason at all for them to have lost. So they had to come up with, instead of saying, maybe the Lord is God, they just say, oh, no, 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 that's not true. We know that's not true because there's multiple gods. So their, God, they must, their gods just must be the gods of the hills. And they're just a little bit stronger than our gods. But you know what? We'll just, we'll just change where we fight them. We're not going to fight them in the hills because their gods are stronger and they'll be able to, to beat us. But our gods, our gods are the, are the gods of the plain. And we'll show their gods, you know, what we have. That's their mindset. Verse number 24. It says, and do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in the rooms. So he's saying, instead of all of you kings being there, though, this time, just put captains in their place. Do not have the actual kings at the battle. Which, to me, just thinks like there's a little bit of doubt still in his mind when he do this. But let's not have the kings there just in case. Let's put captains, someone else to be in charge, right? The captain of the, of the army, captains of the guard. Verse number 25, And number thee an army, like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. Verse number 26, And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. Again, Get this picture. Two little flocks. Look. So there's this, you look out onto the plain and you've got two just small little areas as if there's just a flock of, of kids. Just, you know, this, this small, two small sections and then empty. And then the rest of those that they're fighting against, it's like they just covered the whole area. There's just troop, there's horses, there's chariots, there's footmen, there's all these warriors just surrounding them in just two little flocks. Just, just sitting there in the middle of the country. Verse number 28, And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys, therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So God's, you know, again, telling him and explaining, You are going to win again. But it's, again, it's not because of Ahab. It's not because he repented. It's not because he got right with God. It's because of what they were saying. It's because they were saying that, oh, their gods are the gods of the hill. He's saying, no, we're going to make this known. People are going to realize that the Lord wins the battles, that he's not just the God of the hills. He's the God of the hills. He's the God of the valleys. He's the God of the oceans. He's the God of heaven. He's the God of hell. He's the God of everything because there is only one God and it is the Lord. And these people are going to know that the Lord doth reign in the earth. And he's going to make it known by making this second victory that is an impossible victory to have. And, and that's God's M.O. throughout the Bible. He loves using the people who are weak, the people who are, who are being plagued and ridiculed and, and, and do not have any of their own strength to strengthen them and to lift them up and to just cause the impossible to happen. Just to show that he is the Lord, that he could do whatever he wants. Verse number 29, And they pitched one over against the other seven days, and so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians and 100,000 footmen in one day. One day's worth of killing, 100,000 people died. That's a staggering number, 100,000 people. Verse number 30, but the rest fled to Aphek into the city. And there a wall fell upon 20 and 7,000 of the men that were left. And if that doesn't show you God was involved, I don't know what does. I mean, they didn't even have to fight those people. A wall just fell on them. 27,000 people died because of this wall that fell on them. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. And his servants said unto him, Behold now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings, 
Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Peradventure, he will save thy life. And this is where Ahab blows it. God brings this great victory. Ben Hadad's a wicked king. He's this big bully. And look at how Ahab now is going to respond to their pleas for, for mercy from, uh, from Ben Hadad. Verse number 32. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Thy servant Ben Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. Oh, he's, oh is, is, is Ben Hadad still alive? Oh, he's my brother. And I don't know what Ahab was thinking. Like, it, like why is he trying to, to warm up to this big bully that was been trying to try to destroy him twice? God gave him the victory. He doesn't need to feel some security by making a covenant or a league with this bully that just tried to destroy him. Instead of turning to God and saying, you know what? Forget Ben Hadad. God's going to take care of him. I'm serving the Lord, and I'm going to make my league with the Lord so that God can always protect me. No, he starts speaking comfortably and peaceably unto Ben-Hadad to, to make a covenant or a league with him. Look at verse number 33. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, thy brother Ben-Hadad. See, so they're, they're, they're feeling him out, and they're saying, look, they're trying to be real humble, you know, he's asking for his life and they're just waiting to hear anything that they could jump on as some sign of, of, of peace to, to say, oh yeah, yeah, exactly, yes. And that's what they did. As soon as they heard my brother, they jumped on that and they're like, yeah, thy brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, go ye, bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him and he caused him to come up into the chariot. Not only does he meet with him, but he, meet, he like brings him up into his own chariot. Look at verse number 20, 34. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father, I will restore. He said, Okay, I promise. I'll just, you know, the stuff that my dad took from you guys, I'll, I'll give you that back. I'll give it back to you. I'll restore it. And thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus as my father made in Samaria. So in the same way that we ruled over you and we made our streets in your city and your capital, you'll have, you'll have your streets now in Damascus in the capital of Syria. And then said Ahab, look at his, his answer. I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. He said, okay. Look what that cost him. Look at verse 35. And this is, and this is a real, and look, I'll be honest with you tonight. I don't, like, this is still a little bit puzzling to me. I mean, there's definitely stuff to learn. And I'm going I'm to teach what we can learn out of this. But why God had him do what he did I don't know exactly, but um, look at verse number 35. And a certain, cause, so God's going to send Ahab a message now. God is very displeased that Ahab went and just made a covenant with this wicked king Ben-Hadad and just made peace with him after God just was, was toppling him and destroying him. Verse number 35, And a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. So, <laughs> What, what we have to note here is he says, in the word of the Lord. I mean, this is like, this is God's word that he's disobeying, but, but the commandment was, smite me. He said, he's saying, hit me. He said, look, I, God's telling you, like, like, you need to hit me. Now, this is not a normal thing <laughs> that we see as being a commandment from the Lord for someone, you know, to hit people. But there are some other things that are very interesting that God has told prophets to do. You look at, I mean, read the book of Ezekiel and some of the things that God had Ezekiel do. And when he laid down on the side and he had to eat dung and, you know, I mean, like, there's been some pretty interesting things that God has told people to do. It's always for a greater purpose. I mean, this was for a certain purpose as well. It wasn't just for kicks. I mean, it was God, God has a plan. But look at what happens here. Verse 36 says, Then said he unto him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou de art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. This guy lost his life for not 
hitting a prophet. Now, you don't have to worry. God's given us his word. You don't have to worry about me coming to you and saying, all right, lay me out. Come on, hit me as good as you can. I'm not going to do that. And if, and, and if I do say that and you, and you don't hit me, don't, you don't have to worry about not dying either. I don't think a lion's not going to come and slay you. Okay, because <laughs> oh, yeah, it's not a problem. Don't worry, Pastor. We'll, we'll, it's not a problem. We'll, 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 we'll give you one. But this is, I mean, this is very interesting. But I mean, what I think, the one thing that I take away from this, the one thing that I learned from this, because this is an interesting event, because then he goes to someone else and, and, and he hits them and, and injures them and whatever, and he goes off and, and does his thing. We're going to read the rest of that in just a second. But when there's a commandment from the Lord, you may not understand it completely. You don't know all the ins and outs of it. Why do you want me? You know, that's weird. You know, why should I hit you? But apparently this must have been however it went down like he must have known this was from the Lord well enough for, for God to allow for the man to, to, to lose his life you know what I mean like, like this, was, this was a command from the Lord and he, just, he completely disobeyed it now it may have been weird he probably didn't understand it like what are you talking about here in the face but it was a commandment from the Lord it was the word of the Lord that said you know I want you specifically to do this and one of the things that we could learn from this is that if you're not going to do, even as a saved, you know, especially as a saved person, I believe, someone who's a believer, if you're not going to do the work that God has cut out for you and, and obey the commandment of the Lord when God is calling you and telling you, I want you to do this, and you say, I'm not going to do that, God's not above taking your life. And you look at the story and the parables, especially the parable of the fig tree that wasn't bringing forth fruit. It's a parable. We're not going to go there, but just, if you remember the story, it's a parable of, of, well, hey, there's this tree here and it's not bearing forth fruit. Why is it cumbering the ground? And, and, and the master's saying, you know what? I'm just going to get rid of it. But the, the vine dresser, the husband, he's there. He's saying, you know what? Let's, you know, don't, don't take it down yet. Let's dung it, let's water it, you know, let, let's, let's try to get it to grow fruit, and then if it doesn't bear fruit, then we'll get rid of it. And what I believe that, that parable symbolizes is, look, here's a tree. We're supposed to be trees bearing fruit, getting people saved, preaching the word of God. God has told us, and we have commandments that we're supposed to go out and do this work for the Lord. And if you're not doing anything, it's like, well, what, what are you even here for? I mean, you're saved. God's told you, go out, preach the gospel, reach other people, bring forth much fruit. And he looks down from heaven and he sees you and you're not doing anything. You're just cumbering the ground. You say, well, what are you doing there? What are you sitting there in that pew for? I'll just get rid of you and I'll replace you with someone else who's going to bring forth fruit. I mean, ultimately, that's what he did with the whole nation of Israel. That rejected God and was going after their own false version of, of Judaism and made up their own, their own stuff and they weren't bringing forth fruit at all. They were bringing forth children of, of, of hell more than, more than uh, anything else. We need to have a proper respect for the Lord and when we read commands and we see that you know, God's got this for, you know, for me to do, that he's serious about it. It could have serious consequences. I mean, even Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament in Acts chapter uh, 4 or 5, chapter 5, I think, when they, uh, you know, they sold their possession. I believe they were saved. They sold their, their, you know, whatever, their property or something, and they brought back, they kept back part for themselves, but they told everyone, hey, here's how much we sold it for. We're giving it all to God. We're giving it all to the church. And that was something that they didn't even have to do. It wasn't required of them. And if they wanted to sell it and keep back some for themselves, they could have done that too. They could have just said, well, we sold it for this much. We're going to put a little bit aside and we're going to give you the rest. But they didn't do that either. Instead, they lied about it. And as they didn't lie to men, as the Bible says, they lied to the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? They lost their life. They fell down dead. 
God's not playing games. And the Bible says from that moment, you know, many feared. And a lot of people were just, I mean, that, that's enough to strike fear in you. You say, wow, you know, these, these, this isn't just some book written by some men thousands of years ago. It's the word of God. And when we get the commandments of God, let's take it as such. And let's have respect unto God and his word and say, you know what? If God thought it was important enough to preserve his words for thousands of years so that we can have it today, let's treat it as being important and not just say, yeah, whatever. Amen. Who cares? I'm just going to go do my own thing and not bear any fruit. Well, don't be surprised if that's your attitude. If you're no longer a tree because God cuts you down and, and takes you home. So why are you cumbering the ground? Anyways, that's, the, that's what I get from, from this particular story being, being written here, saying, you know, but he didn't smite them. You know, he didn't hit the guy, but he was commanded to do it. It was a commandment from the Lord, and he directly disobeyed it. Now, we know that God doesn't do that with every single sin when you disobey God. He's just automatically going to take your life. But you don't know when you do do something where God's just going to say, okay, that's it. I've had enough. Well, let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 38. So the prophet departed and wait. Oh, um, no, verse number 37. Then he found another man. So he found someone else and said, smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him. So that in smiting, he wounded him. So he's like, okay, no problem. I got this. You know, and he hits him. And, and he hit him so hard, I, he actually wounded him a little bit. But, uh, but that's what he wanted. That's, what, that's exactly what he was looking for. Verse number 38, so the prophet departed and waited for the king, by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. So what he was doing, he was trying to make it look like he was in a battle. That was his point. He wanted to make it look like he got scuffed up. You know, he's got some dirt on his face. He's dirty. He got hit. He's got, you know, he's got this wound because it's, it's part of his disguise when he approaches the king so that he can, he can deliver the message to Ahab that he wants to deliver. And um, verse 39, And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and sa he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. The king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be. Thyself has decided. And so he's saying, you know, the story says, like, look, this guy delivered this man for me to watch. And he says, you need to watch this person. And if, and if he gets away, then your life is going to be for his life. And he tells this to the king. He's saying, well, as I got busy, I was doing this, I was doing that, and the, and the guy got away. And the king's like, well, <laughs> okay, that's pretty easy to decide. Because the king in these days is still supposed to be a judge, right? I mean, you're supposed to judge matters and judge, right? So he said, well, there you go. You said it, right? You'd let him go. And then he makes himself known to him here. So he says uh, in verse 41, and he hasted and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. So as soon as he, you know, kind of cleans himself up, he realizes, oh, wait, this is one of the prophets. And verse 42, he says, and he said unto him, thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction. Therefore, thy life shall go for his life and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. So God had it to, to have Ben-Hadad destroyed. This was God's plan. It was God's plan when he told Elijah to anoint Hazael. It was God's plan when he decided to lift up Ahab and the, king, and the, and the, the children of Israel to win these great victories over, over uh, Syria and Ben-Hadad. And he says, you know, I mean, they were appointed to destruction. What are you thinking? What are you doing now letting him go free and making a deal with him and making a covenant with him? He's saying, okay, if that's the way you want it, you've just switched places with him now. Ben-Hadad's going to get let go and now you're going to die. And now your people are going to go for his people. And Ahab doesn't like to hear that, but again, Ahab was real weak and he was real control. He was controlled by, I mean, every story that we read with Ahab, it's not very many, but he's controlled by his wife first and foremost. 
which is a big problem. And I'm not even going to get into all that tonight. That's a whole nother sermon. Men, being controlled by your wives, don't let it happen. First of all, don't marry a wicked wife. Because that's even worse, being controlled by an extremely wicked wife. But he was controlled by his wife. He was controlled by even his counselors, basically. You know, in the beginning of the story, when he, he, you know, he was going to his counselors, he gave one answer of just take whatever you want. And then he goes to his, to his counselors and the elders and stuff, and they're saying, no, like, don't, don't give in to him. So then he listens to them. He, he didn't do anything when Elijah you know, killed all those prophets of Baal. He went along with it, even though he knew his wife would probably be angry with it. He was too weak to do anything about it. Okay. He's approached by the man of God saying that, hey, God's going to bring you this victory and you're going to know that the Lord is. Well, who's, who's going to do it? Who's going to lead him? You are. He's a weak, weak individual. And he couldn't even finish the job with Ben-Hadad and say, Ben-Hadad, you're wicked you're going to be destroyed. Obviously, God's bringing you down, and I'm going to finish the job. He was too weak to even do that and made a covenant with him. And as a result, it cost him his life. We need to have boldness. We need to have strength. We need to have strength from the Lord. I mean, that's where our strength should lie in anyways. Don't, get, don't let bullies push you around. Don't let anybody tell you you can't preach the Word of God. You can't believe that. You can, you know, don't, let them, don't let them scare you. Don't have the fear. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, all these stories in the Bible. Lord, we pray that you would please just help us to, to be bold. Lord, help us to walk in the Spirit. Help us to mortify the deeds of the flesh so that we can be walking in the Spirit evermore and just, and just be able to, um, to know that we're doing your will and that we're right with you, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to be receptive to all of your instructions and all the warnings, dear Lord, and um, that we're doing as much as we possibly can to serve you and, and um, that you would be with us then and watch over us and protect us so that we know that we could rely on you. You know that you've done many great things to, uh, to help people that were in need and, and that had uh, their own weaknesses, Lord, that you've made them strong. We pray that you would please make us strong in the, in the midst of this dark and crooked and perverted world, dear Lord, that you would help us to boldly proclaim the word of truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.